Chapter 6 of Journey to the Center of the Earth by Jules Verne. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Brian Aidy. Journey to the Center of the Earth. Chapter 6 Our Voyage to Iceland. The hour of departure came at last. The night before, the worthy Mr. Thompson brought us the most cordial letters of introduction for Baron Tramp, Governor of Iceland, for Mr. Picturson, coadjutor to the Bishop, and for Mr. Finson, Mayor of the town of Reykjavik. In return, my uncle nearly crushed his hands, so warmly did he shake them. On the second of the month, at two in the morning, our precious cargo of luggage was taken on board the good ship Valkyrie. We followed and were politely introduced by the captain to a small cabin with two standing bed-places, neither very well ventilated nor very comfortable. But in the cause of science men are expected to suffer. "'Well, and have we a fair wind?' cried my uncle in his most mellifluous accents. "'An excellent wind!' cried Captain Bjarn. "'We shall leave the sound going free with all sails set.' A few minutes afterwards the schooner started before the wind, under all the canvas she could carry, and entered the channel. An hour later, the capital of Denmark seemed to sink into the waves, and we were at no great distance from the coast of Elsinore. My uncle was delighted. For myself, moody and dissatisfied, I appeared almost to expect a glimpse of the ghost of Hamlet. Sublime madman, thought I, you doubtless would approve our proceedings. You might perhaps even follow us to the center of the earth, there to resolve your eternal doubts." But no ghost or anything else appeared upon the ancient walls. The fact is, the castle is much later than the time of the heroic prince of Denmark. It is now the residence of the keeper of the Strait of the Sound, and through that sound more than fifteen thousand vessels of all nations pass every year. The castle of Kronborg soon disappeared in the murky atmosphere, as well as the tower of Helsingborg, which raises its head on the Swedish bank. And here the schooner began to feel in earnest the breezes of the Kattegat. The Valkyrie was swift enough, but with all sailing boats there is the same uncertainty. Her cargo was coal, furniture, pottery, woolen clothing, and a load of corn. As usual, the crew was small, five Danes doing the whole of the work. "'How long will the voyage last?' asked my uncle. "'Well, I think about ten days,' replied the skipper, "'unless indeed we meet with some northeast gales from the Faroe Islands.' "'At all events, there will be no very considerable delay,' cried the impatient professor. "'No, Mr. Hardwig,' said the captain. "'No fear of that. At all events, we shall get there some day.' Towards evening, the schooner doubled Cape Skagen, the northernmost part of Denmark, crossed the Skagerrat during the night, skirted the extreme point of Norway through the gut of Cape Lindesness, and then reached the northern seas. Two days later we were not far from the coast of Scotland, somewhere near what the Danish sailors call Peterhead, and then the Valkyrie stretched out for the Faroe Islands between Orkney and Shetland. Our vessel now felt the full force of the ocean waves, and the wind shifting, we with great difficulty made the Faroe Islands. On the eighth day the captain made out McGuinness, the westernmost of the isles, and from that moment headed direct for Portland, a cape on the southern shores of the singular island for which we were bound. The voyage offered no incident worthy of record. I bore it very well, but my uncle, to his great annoyance and even shame, was remarkably seasick. This small demur troubled him the more that it prevented him from questioning Captain Bjarn as to the subject of Sneffels, as to the means of communication and the facilities of transport. All these explanations he had to adjourn to the period of his arrival. His time, meanwhile, was spent lying in bed groaning and dwelling anxiously on the hoped-for termination of the voyage. I didn't pity him. On the eleventh day we sighted Cape Portland, over which towered Mount Midrill's Yokel, which, the weather being clear, we made out very readily. The cape itself is nothing but a huge mount of granite standing naked and alone to meet the Atlantic waves. The Valkyrie kept off the coast, steering to the westward. On all sides were to be seen whole schools of whales and sharks. After some hours we came in sight of a solitary rock in the ocean, forming a mighty vault through which the foaming waves poured with intense fury. The islets of Westman appeared to leap from the ocean, being so low in the water as scarcely to be seen until you were right upon them. 
From that moment, the schooner was steered to the westward in order to round Cape Reykjans, the western point of Iceland. My uncle, to his great disgust, was unable even to crawl on deck, so heavy a sea was on, and thus lost the first view of the land of promise. Forty-eight hours later, after a storm which drove us far to sea under bare poles, we came once more in sight of land, and were boarded by a pilot who, after three hours of dangerous navigation, brought the schooner safely to an anchor in the bay of Foxa before Reykjavik. My uncle came out of his cabin pale, haggard, thin, but full of enthusiasm, his eyes dilated with pleasure and satisfaction. Nearly the whole population of the town was on foot to see us land. The fact was that scarcely any one of them but expected some goods by the periodical vessel. Professor Hardwig was in haste to leave his prison, or rather, as he called it, his hospital. But before he attempted to do so, he caught hold of my hand, led me to the quarter-deck of the schooner, took my arm with his left hand, and pointed inland with his right, over the northern part of the bay, to where rose a high two-peaked mountain, a double cone covered with eternal snow. Behold, he whispered in an awe-stricken voice, behold Mount Sneffels. Then without further remark, he put his finger to his lips, frowned darkly, and descended into the small boat which awaited us. I followed, and in a few minutes we stood upon the soil of mysterious Iceland. Scarcely were we fairly on shore, when there appeared before us a man of excellent appearance, wearing the costume of a military officer. He was, however, but a civil servant, a magistrate, the governor of the island, Baron Tramp. The professor knew whom he had to deal with. He therefore handed him the letters from Copenhagen, and a brief conversation in Danish followed, to which I, of course, was a stranger, and for a very good reason, for I did not know the language in which they conversed. I afterwards heard, however, that Baron Tramp placed himself entirely at the beck and call of Professor Hardwig. My uncle was most graciously received by Mr. Finson, the mayor, who, as far as costume went, was quite as military as the governor, but also from character and occupation quite as pacific. As for his coadjutor, Mr. Picturson, he was absent on an episcopal visit to the northern portion of the diocese. We were therefore compelled to defer the pleasure of being presented to him. His absence was, however, more than compensated by the presence of Mr. Fridrikson, professor of natural science in the College of Reykjavik, a man of invaluable ability. This modest scholar spoke no languages save Icelandic and Latin. When, therefore, he addressed himself to me in the language of Horace, we at once came to understand one another. He was, in fact, the only person that I did thoroughly understand during the whole period of my residence in this benighted island. Out of three rooms of which his house was composed, two were placed at our service, and in a few hours we were installed with all our baggage, the amount of which rather astonished the simple inhabitants of Reykjavik. "'Now, Harry,' said my uncle, rubbing his hands, "'on goes well. The worst difficulty is now over.' "'How the worst difficulty over?' I cried in fresh amazement. Doubtless. Here we are in Iceland. Nothing more remains but to descend into the bowels of the earth. Well, sir, to a certain extent you are right. We have only to go down, but, as far as I am concerned, that is not the question. I want to know how we are to get up again. That is the least part of the business, and does not in any way trouble me. In the meantime, there is not an hour to lose. I am about to visit the public library. Very likely I may find there some manuscripts from the hand of Saknusum. I shall be glad to consult them. In the meanwhile, I replied, I will take a walk through the town. Will you not likewise do so? I feel no interest in the subject, said my uncle. What for me is curious in this island is not what is above the surface, but what is below. I bowed by way of reply, put on my hat and furred cloak, and went out. It was not an easy matter to lose oneself in the two streets of Reykjavik. I had, therefore, no need to ask my way. The town lies on a flat and marshy plain between two hills. A vast field of lava skirted on one side, falling away in terraces toward the sea. On the other hand is the large bay of Foxa, bordered on the north by the enormous glacier of Sneffels, and in which bay the Valkyrie was then the only vessel at anchor. Generally there was one or two English or French gunboats to watch and protect the fisheries in the offing. They were now, however, absent on duty. 
The longest of the streets of Reykjavik runs parallel to the shore. In this street the merchants and traders live in wooden huts made with beams of wood, painted red, mere log huts such as you would find in the wilds of America. The other street, situated more to the west, runs toward a little lake between the residences of the bishop and the other personages not engaged in commerce. I had soon seen all I wanted of these weary and dismal thoroughfares. Here and there was a strip of discolored turf, like an old worn-out bit of woolen carpet, and now and then a bit of kitchen garden in which grew potatoes, cabbage, and lettuce, almost diminutive enough to suggest the idea of Lilliput. In the center of the new commercial street, I found the public cemetery, enclosed by an earthen wall. Though not very large, it appeared not likely to be filled for centuries. From hence I went to the house of the governor, a mere hut in comparison with the mansion house of Hamburg, but a palace alongside the other Icelandic houses. Between the little lake and the town was the church, built in simple Protestant style, and composed of calcined stones thrown up by volcanic action. I have not the slightest doubt that in high winds its red tiles were blown out, to the great annoyance of the pastor and congregation. Upon an eminence close at hand was the national school, in which were taught Hebrew, English, French, and Danish. In three hours my tour was complete. The general impression upon my mind was sadness. No trees, no vegetation, so to speak. On all sides volcanic peaks, the huts of turf and earth, more like roofs than houses. Thanks to the heat of these residences, grass grows on the roof, which grass is carefully cut for hay. I saw but few inhabitants during my excursion, but I met a crowd on the beach drying, salting, and loading codfish, the principal article of exportation. The men appeared robust but heavy, fair-haired like Germans, but of pensive mien, exiles of a higher scale in the ladder of humanity than the Eskimos, but, I thought, much more unhappy, since with superior perceptions they are compelled to live within the limits of the polar circle. Sometimes they gave vent to a convulsive laugh, but by no chance did they smile. Their costumes consist of a coarse capote of black wool, known in Scandinavian countries as the vaudmel, a broad-brimmed hat, trousers of red serge, and a piece of leather tied with strings for a shoe, a coarse kind of moccasin. The women, though sad-looking and mournful, had rather agreeable features, without much expression. They wore a bodice and petticoat of somber vaudmel. When unmarried, they wear a little brown knitted cap over a crown of plaited hair, but when married, they cover their heads with a colored handkerchief, over which they tie a white scarf. End of chapter 6、Chapter、seven of Journey to the Center of the Earth by Jules Verne. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. This recording by Brian a d y Journey to the Center of the Earth by Jules Verne. Chapter 7 Conversation and Discovery. When I returned, dinner was ready. This meal was devoured by my worthy relative with avidity and voracity. His shipboard diet had turned his interior into a perfect gulf. The repast, which was more Danish than Icelandic, was in itself nothing, but the excessive hospitality of our hosts made us enjoy it doubly. The conversation turned upon scientific matters, and Mr. Fridrikson asked my uncle what he thought of the public library. Library, sir, cried my uncle. It appears to me a collection of useless odd volumes and a beggarly amount of empty shelves. What? cried Mr. Fridrikson. Why, we have eight thousand volumes of most rare and valuable works, some in Scandinavian language, besides all the new publications from Copenhagen. Eight thousand volumes? My dear sir, why, where are they? cried my uncle. Scattered over the country, Professor Hardwig. We are very studious, my dear sir, though we do live in Iceland. Every farmer, every laborer, Every fisherman can both read and write, and we think that books, instead of being locked up in cupboards, far from the sight of students, should be distributed as widely as possible. The books of our library are therefore passed from hand to hand without returning to the library shelves perhaps for years. Then, when foreigners visit you, there is nothing for them to see? 
Well, sir, foreigners have their own libraries, and our first consideration is that our humbler classes should be highly educated. Fortunately, the love of study is innate in the Icelandic people. In 1816 we found that a literary society and mechanics institute. Many foreign scholars of eminence are honorary members. We publish books destined to educate our people, and these books have rendered valuable services to our country. Allow me to have the honor, Professor Hardwig, to enroll you as an honorary member. My uncle, who already belonged to nearly every literary and scientific institution in Europe, immediately yielded to the amiable wishes of the good Mr. Friedrichsen. "'And now,' he said, after many expressions of gratitude and goodwill, "'if you will tell me what books you expect to find, perhaps I may be of some assistance to you.' I watched my uncle keenly. For a minute or two he hesitated, as if unwilling to speak. To speak openly was, perhaps, to unveil his projects. Nevertheless, after some reflection, he made up his mind. "'Well,' Mr. Friedrichsen, he said in an easy, unconcerned kind of way, I was desirous of ascertaining if among other valuable works you had any of the learned Arn Socknusum. Arn Socknusum! cried the professor of Reykjavik. You speak of one of the most distinguished scholars of the sixteenth century, of the great naturalist, the great alchemist, the great traveller. Exactly so. One of the most distinguished men connected with Icelandic science and literature. "'As you say, sir. "'A man illustrious above all. "'Yes, sir. "'All this is true. "'But his works? "'We have none of them. "'Not in Iceland?' "'There are none in Iceland, or elsewhere,' "'answered the other sadly. "'Why so? "'Because Arnsok Newsom "'was persecuted for heresy, "'and in 1573 "'his works were publicly burnt at Copenhagen "'by the hands of the common hangman. "'Very good.' Capital, murmured my uncle, to the great astonishment of the worthy Icelander. You said, sir? Yes, yes, all is clear. I see the link in the chain. Everything is explained, and I now understand why Arnsok Newsom, put out of court, forced to hide his magnificent discoveries, was compelled to conceal beneath the veil of an incomprehensible cryptograph the secret. What secret? A secret which, stammered my uncle, "'Have you discovered some wonderful manuscript?' cried Mr. Friedrichsen. "'No, no. I was carried away by my enthusiasm. A, a mere supposition.' "'Very good, sir. But really, to turn to another subject, I hope you will not leave our island without examining into its mineralogical riches.' "'Well, the fact is, I am rather late. So many learned men have been here before me.' "'Yes, yes. But there is still much to be done,' cried Mr. Friedrichsen. "'You think so?' said my uncle, his eyes twinkling with hidden satisfaction. "'Yes, you have no idea how many unknown mountains, glaciers, volcanoes there are which remain to be studied. Without moving from where we sit, I can show you one. Yonder on the edge of the horizon you see Sneffels.' "'Oh, yes, Sneffels,' said my uncle. "'One of the most curious volcanoes in existence, the crater of which has been rarely visited.' "'Extinct?' "'Extinct!' any time these five hundred years was the ready reply well said my uncle who dug his nails into his flesh and pressed his knees tightly together to prevent himself leaping up with joy i have a great mind to begin my studies with an examination of the geological mysteries of this mount cephal Faisal, what do you call it sneffels my dear sir this portion of the conversation took place in latin and i therefore understood all that had been said I could scarcely keep my countenance when I found my uncle so cunningly concealing his delight and satisfaction. I must confess that his artful grimaces, put on to conceal his happiness, made him look like a new Mephistopheles. "'Yes, yes,' he continued. "'Your proposition delights me. I will endeavor to climb to the summit of Sneffels, and, if possible, will descend into its crater.' "'I very much regret,' continued Mr. Friedrichsen, that my occupation will entirely preclude the possibility of my accompanying you. It would have been both pleasurable and profitable if I could have spared the time. No, no, a thousand times no, cried my uncle. I do not wish to disturb the serenity of any man. I thank you, however, with all my heart. The presence of one so learned as yourself would no doubt have been most useful, but the duties of your office and profession before everything. In the innocence of a simple heart, 
Our host did not perceive the irony of these remarks. I entirely approve your project, continued the Icelander after some further remarks. It is a good idea to begin by examining this volcano. You will make a harvest of curious observations. In the first place, how do you propose to get to Sneffels? By sea. I shall cross the bay. Of course that is the most rapid route. Of course, but still it cannot be done. Why? We have not an available boat in all Reykjavik, replied the other. What is to be done? You must go by land along the coast. It is longer, but much more interesting. Then I must have a guide. Of course, and I have your very man. Somebody on whom I can depend? Yes, an inhabitant of the peninsula on which Sneffels is situated. He is a very shrewd and worthy man, with whom you will be pleased. He speaks Danish like a Dane. When can I see him? Today? No, tomorrow. He will not be here before. Tomorrow be it, replied my uncle with a deep sigh. The conversation ended by compliments on both sides. During the dinner, my uncle had learned much as to the history of Arn Soknusum, the reasons for his mysterious and hieroglyphical document. He also became aware that his host would not accompany him on his adventurous expedition, and that next day we should have a guide. End of Chapter 7、Chapter 8 of Journey to the Center of the Earth by Jules Verne. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. This recording by Brian a d y Journey to the Center of the Earth by Jules Verne. Chapter 8 The Eiderdown Hunter. Off at last. That evening I took a brief walk on the shore near Reykjavik, after which I returned to an early sleep on my bed of coarse planks, where I slept the sleep of the just. When I awoke, I heard my uncle speaking loudly in the next room. I rose hastily and joined him. He was talking in Danish with a man of tall stature and of perfectly Herculean build. This man appeared to be possessed of very great strength. His eyes, which started rather prominently from a very large head, The face belonging to which was simple and naive appeared very quick and intelligent. Very long hair, which even in England would have been accounted exceedingly red, fell over his athletic shoulders. This native of Iceland was active and supple in appearance, though he scarcely moved his arms, being in fact one of those men who despises the habit of gesticulation common to southern people. Everything in this man's manner revealed a calm and phlegmatic temperament. There was nothing indolent about him, but his appearance spoke of tranquillity. He was one of those who never seemed to expect anything from anybody, who liked to work when he thought proper, and whose philosophy nothing could astonish or trouble. I began to comprehend his character simply from the way in which he listened to the wild and impassioned verbiage of my worthy uncle. While the excellent professor spoke sentence after sentence, he stood with folded arms, utterly still, motionless to all of my uncle's gesticulations. When he wanted to say no, he moved his head from left to right. When he acquiesced, he nodded. So slightly that you could have scarcely seen the undulation of his head. This economy of motion was carried to the length of avarice. Judging from his appearance, I should have been a long time before I had suspected him to be what he was, a mighty hunter. Certainly his manner was not likely to frighten the game. How, then, did he contrive to get at his prey? My surprise was slightly modified when I knew that this tranquil and solemn personage was only a hunter of the eider duck, the down of which is, after all, the greatest source of the Icelander's wealth. In the early days of summer, the female of the eider, a pretty sort of duck, builds its nest amid the rocks of the fjords, the name given to all narrow gulfs in Scandinavian countries, with which every part of the island is indented. No sooner has the eider duck made her nest than she lines the inside of it with the softest down from her breast. Then comes the hunter or trader, taking away the nest. The poor bereaved female begins her task over again, and this continues as long as any eider down is to be found. When she can find no more, the male bird sets to work to see what he can do. As, however, his down is not so soft, and therefore has no commercial value, the hunter does not take the trouble to rob him of his nest lining. The nest is accordingly finished, the eggs are laid, the little ones are born, and next year the harvest of eider down is again collected. Now, as the eider duck never selects steep rocks or aspects to build its nest, but rather sloping and low cliffs near to the sea, The Icelandic hunter can carry on his trade operations without much difficulty. 
He is like a farmer who has neither to plow, to sow, nor to harrow, only to collect his harvest. This grave, sententious, silent person, as phlegmatic as an Englishman on the French stage, was named Hans Bielke. He had called upon us in consequence of the recommendation of Mr. Friedrichsen. He was, in fact, our future guide. It struck me that had I sought the world over, I could not have found a greater contradiction to my impulsive uncle. They, however, readily understood one another. Neither of them had any thought about money. One was ready to take all that was offered him, the other ready to offer anything that was asked. It may readily be conceived, then, that an understanding was soon to come between them. Now, the understanding was that he was to take us to the village of Stapi, situated on the southern slope of the peninsula of Sneffels, at the very foot of the volcano. Hans, the guide, told us the distance was about twenty-two miles, a journey which my uncle supposed would take about two days. But when my uncle came to understand that they were Danish miles, of eight thousand yards each, he was obliged to be more moderate in his ideas, and, considering the horrible roads we had to follow, to allow eight or ten days for the journey. Four horses were prepared for us, two to carry the baggage, and two to bear the important weight of myself and uncle. Hans declared that nothing ever would make him climb on the back of any animal. He knew every inch of that part of the coast, and promised to take us the very shortest way. His engagement with my uncle was by no means to cease with our arrival at Stoppy. He was further to remain in his service during the whole time required for the completion of his scientific investigations, at the fixed salary of three rix dollars a week being exactly fourteen shillings and twopence, minus one farthing, English currency. One stipulation, however, was made by the guide. The money was to be paid to him every Saturday night, failing which his engagement was at an end. The day of our departure was fixed. My uncle wished to hand the Eiderdown hunter in advance, but he refused in one emphatic word. Efter. Which being translated from Icelandic into plain English means after. The treaty concluded... Our worthy guide retired without another word. A splendid fellow, said my uncle. Only he little suspects the marvelous part he is about to play in the history of the world. You mean, then, I cried in amazement, that he should accompany us? To the interior of the earth, yes, replied my uncle. Why not? There were yet forty-eight hours to elapse before we made our final start. To my great regret, our whole time was taken up in making preparations for our journey. All our industry and ability were devoted to packing every object in the most advantageous manner, the instruments on one side, the arms on the other, the tools here and the provisions there. There were, in fact, four distinct groups. The instruments were, of course, of the best manufacture. 1. A centigrade thermometer of Eigel, counting up to 150 degrees, which to me did not appear half enough or too much. Too hot by half, if the degree of heat was to ascend so high, in which case we would certainly be cooked, not enough if we wanted to ascertain the exact temperature of springs or metal in a state of fusion. 2. A manometer, which worked by compressed air, an instrument used to ascertain the upper atmospheric pressure on the level of the ocean. Perhaps a common barometer would not have done as well, the atmospheric pressure being likely to increase in proportion as we descended below the surface of the earth. 3. A first-class chronometer made by Boissonis of Geneva, set at the meridian of Hamburg, from which the Germans calculate, as the English do from Greenwich, and the French from Paris. 4. Two compasses, one for horizontal guidance, the other to ascertain the dip. 5. A night glass. 6. Two Ruhmkorff coils, which, by means of a current of electricity, would ensure us a very excellent, easily carried, and certain means of obtaining light. 7. A voltic battery on the newest principle. Footnote. Thermometer. Thermos and metron. Measure. An instrument for measuring the temperature of the air. Manometer. Monos and metron. Measure. An instrument to show the density or rarity of gases. Chronometer. Chronos, time, and metros, measure. A time measurer, or superior watch. Ruhmkorff's coil. An instrument for producing currents of induced electricity of great intensity. It consists of a coil of copper wire, insulated by being covered with silk, surrounded by another coil of fine wire, also insulated, in which a momentary current is induced when a current is passed through the inner coil from a voltic battery. When the apparatus is in action, the gas becomes luminous and produces a white and continued light. 
The battery and wire are carried in a leather bag, which the traveler fastens by a strap to his shoulders. The lantern is in front, and enables the benighted wanderer to see in the most profound obscurity. He may venture without fear of explosion into the midst of the most inflammable gases, and the lantern will burn beneath the deepest waters. H. D. Ruhmkorff, an able and learned chemist, discovered the induction coil. In 1864 he won the quinquennial French prize of 2,000 pounds for this ingenious application of electricity. A voltic battery, so called from Volta, its designer, is an apparatus consisting of a series of metal plates arranged in pairs and subjected to the action of saline solutions for producing currents of electricity. End footnote. Our arms consisted of two rifles, with two revolving six-shooters. Why these arms were provided it was impossible for me to say. I had every reason to believe that we had neither wild beasts nor savage natives to fear. My uncle, on the other hand, was quite devoted to his arsenal and to his collection of instruments, and above all was very careful with his provision of fulminating or gun cotton, warranted to keep in any climate, and of which the expansive force was known to be greater than that of ordinary gunpowder. Our tools consisted of two pickaxes, two crowbars, a silken ladder, three iron-shod alpine poles, a hatchet, a hammer, a dozen wedges, some pointed pieces of iron, and a quantity of strong rope. You may conceive that the whole made a tolerable parcel, especially when I mentioned that the ladder itself was 300 feet long. Then there came the important question of provisions. The hamper was not very large, but tolerably satisfactory, for I knew that in concentrated essence of meat and biscuit there was enough to last six months. The only liquid provided by my uncle was shitum, of water not a drop. We had, however, an ample supply of gourds, and my uncle counted on finding water, and enough to fill them, as soon as we commenced our downward journey. My remarks as to the temperature, the quality, and even the possibility of none being found, remained wholly without effect. To make up the exact list of our traveling gear for the guidance of future travelers, add that we carried a medicine and surgical chest, with all apparatus necessary for wounds, fractures, and blows, lint, scissors, lancets, in fact a perfect collection of horrible-looking instruments, a number of vials containing ammonia, alcohol, ether, gallard water, aromatic vinegar, in fact, every possible and impossible drug. Finally, all the materials for working the Ruhmkorff coil. My uncle had also been careful to lay in a goodly supply of tobacco, several flasks of very fine gunpowder, boxes of tinder, besides a large belt crammed full of notes and gold. Good boots rendered watertight were to be found to the number of six in the toolbox. My boy, with such clothing, with such boots, and such general equipment, said my uncle, in a state of rapturous delight, we may hope to travel far. It took a whole day to put these matters in order. In the evening we dined with Baron Tramp, in company with the mayor of Reykjavik, and Dr. Hjaltalin, a great medical man of Iceland. Mr. Friedrichsen was not present, and I was afterwards sorry to hear that he and the governor did not agree on some matters connected with the administration of the island. Unfortunately, the consequence was that I did not understand a word that was said at dinner a kind of semi-official reception. One thing I can say, my uncle never left off speaking. The next day our labor came to an end. Our worthy host delighted my uncle, Professor Hardwig, by giving him a good map of Iceland, a most important and precious document for a mineralogist. Our last evening was spent in a long conversation with Mr. Friedrichsen, whom I liked very much, the more that I never expected to see him or anyone else again. After this agreeable way of spending an hour or so, I tried to sleep, in vain. With the exception of a few dozes, my night was miserable. At five o'clock in the morning I was awakened from the only real half-hour sleep of the night by the loud neighing of horses under my window. I hastily dressed myself and went down into the street. Hans was engaged in putting the finishing stroke to our baggage, which he did in a silent, quiet way that won my admiration, and yet he did it admirably well. My uncle wasted a great deal of breath in giving him directions, but worthy Hans took not the slightest notice of his words. At six o'clock, all our preparations were completed, and Mr. Friedrichsen shook hands heartily with us. My uncle thanked him warmly, in Icelandic language, for his hospitality, speaking truly from the heart. As for myself, I put together a few of my best Latin phrases and paid him the highest compliments I could. This fraternal and friendly duty performed, we sallied forth and mounted our horses. As soon as we were quite ready, Mr. Friedrichsen advanced, and by way of farewell, called after me the words of Virgil, words which appeared to have been made for us, travelers starting for an uncertain destination. Et cacunque viam diderit fortuna sequamar. 
and whichsoever way thou goest, may fortune follow. End of chapter 8「When we commenced our adventurous and perilous journey, we had neither to fear fatiguing heat nor drenching rain. It was, in fact, real tourist weather. As there was nothing I liked better than horse exercise, the pleasure of riding through an unknown country caused the early part of our enterprise to be particularly agreeable to me. I began to enjoy the exhilarating delight of traveling, a life of desire, gratification, and liberty. The truth is that my spirits rose so rapidly that I began to be indifferent to what had once appeared to be a terrible journey. After all, I said to myself, simply to take a journey through a curious country, to climb a remarkable mountain, and, if the worst comes to the worst, to descend into a crater of an extinct volcano. There could be no doubt that this was all this terrible Sock Newsome had done. As to the existence of a gallery, or of subterraneous passages leading to the interior of the earth, the idea was simply absurd, the hallucinations of a distempered imagination. All, then, that may be required of me I will do cheerfully, and will create no difficulty. It was just before we left Reykjavik that I came to this decision. Hans, our extraordinary guide, went first, walking with a steady, rapid, unvarying step. Our two horses with the luggage followed of their own accord, without requiring whip or spur. My uncle and I came behind, cutting a very tolerable figure upon our small but vigorous animals. Iceland is one of the largest islands in Europe. It contains 30,000 square miles of surface, and has about 70,000 inhabitants. Geographers have divided it into four parts, and we had to cross the southwest quarter, which in the vernacular is called Sudvest Fjordinger. Hans, on taking his departure from Reykjavik, had followed the line of the sea. We took our way through poor and sparse meadows, which made a desperate effort every year to show a little green. They very rarely succeeded in a good show of yellow. The rugged summits of the rocky hills were dimly visible on the edge of the horizon, through the misty fogs. Every now and then some heavy flakes of snow showed conspicuous in the morning light, while certain lofty and pointed rocks were first lost in the gray low clouds, their summits clearly visible above like jagged reefs rising from a troublous sea. Every now and then a spur of rock came down through the arid ground, leaving us scarcely room to pass. Our horses, however, appeared not only well acquainted with the country, but by a kind of instinct knew which was the best road. My uncle had not even the satisfaction of urging forward his steed by whip, spur, or voice. It was utterly useless to show any signs of impatience. I could not help smiling to see him look so big on his little horse. His long legs now and then touching the ground made him look like a six-footed centaur. "'Good beast! Good beast!' he would cry. "'I assure you that I begin to think no animal is more intelligent than an Icelandic horse. Snow, tempest, impracticable roads, rocks, icebergs, nothing stops him.' He is brave, he is sober, he is safe, he never makes a false step, never glides or slips from his path. I dare say that if any river, any fjord has to be crossed, and I have no doubt there will be many, you will see him enter the water without hesitation like an amphibious animal, and reach the opposite side in safety. We must not, however, attempt to hurry him, we must allow him to have his own way, and I will undertake to say that between us we shall do our ten leagues a day. We may do so, was my reply, but what about our worthy guide? I have not the slightest anxiety about him. That sort of people go ahead without even knowing what they are about. Look at Hans. He moves so little that it is impossible for him to become fatigued. Besides, if he were to complain of weariness, he could have the loan of my horse. I should have a violent attack of the cramp if I were not to have some sort of exercise. My arms are right, but my legs are getting a little stiff. All this while we were advancing at a rapid pace. The country we had reached was already nearly a desert. Here and there could be seen an isolated farm, some solitary burr, or Icelandic house, built of wood, earth, fragments of lava, looking like beggars on the highway of life. These wretched and miserable huts excited in us such pity that we felt half disposed to leave alms at every door. In this country there are no roads, 
paths are nearly unknown, and vegetation, poor as it was, slowly as it reached perfection, soon obliterated all trace of the few travelers who passed from place to place. Nevertheless, this division of the province, situated only a few miles from the capital, is considered one of the best cultivated and most thickly populated in all Iceland. What, then, must be the state of the less known and more distant parts of the island? After traveling fully a half-Danish mile, we had met neither a farmer at the door of his hut, nor even a wandering shepherd with his wild and savage flock. A few stray cows and sheep were only seen occasionally. What, then, must we expect when we come to the upheaved regions, to the districts broken and roughened from volcanic eruptions and subterraneous commotions? We were to learn this all in good time. I say, however, on consulting the map, that we avoided a good deal of this rough country by following the winding and desolate shores of the sea. In reality, the great volcanic movement of the island, and all its attendant phenomena, are concentrated in the interior of the island. There, horizontal layers or strata of rocks, piled one upon the other, eruptions of basaltic origin, and streams of lava have given this country a kind of supernatural reputation. Little did I expect, however, the spectacle which awaited us when we reached the peninsula of Sneffels, where agglomerations of nature's ruins form a kind of terrible chaos. Some two hours or more after we had left the city of Reykjavik, we reached the little town called Eolkirkja, or the principal church. It consists simply of a few houses, not what in England or Germany we should call a hamlet. Hans stopped here one half hour. He shared our frugal breakfast, answered yes and no to my uncle's questions as to the nature of the road, and at last, when asked where we were to pass the night, was as laconic as usual. Gardar was his one-worded reply. I took occasion to consult the map, to see where Gardar was to be found. After looking keenly, I found a small town of that name on the borders of the Hjalford, about four miles from Reykjavik. I pointed this out to my uncle, who made a very energetic grimace. Only four miles out of twenty-two? Why, it is only a little walk. He was about to make some energetic observation to the guide, but Hans, without taking the slightest notice of him, went in front of the horses, and walked ahead with the same imperturbable phlegm he had always exhibited. Three hours later, still traveling over those apparently interminable and sandy prairies, we were compelled to go around the Kalafjord, an easier and shorter cut than crossing the gulfs. Shortly after, we entered a place of communal jurisdiction called Eilberg, and the clock of which would then have struck twelve, if any Icelandic church had been rich enough to possess so valuable and useful an article. These sacred edifices are, however, very much like these people, who do without watches, and never miss them. Here, the horses were allowed to take some rest and refreshment, then, following a narrow strip of shore, between high rocks and the sea, they took us without further halt to the Eolkirkja of Brontar, and after another mile, to Sarbor Anexia, a chapel of ease, situated on the southern bank of the Hjalfjord. It was about four o'clock in the evening, and we had traveled four Danish miles, about equal to twenty English. The fjord was in this place about half a mile in width. The sweeping and broken waves came rolling in upon the pointed rocks. The gulf was surrounded by rocky walls, a mighty cliff, three thousand feet in height, remarkable for its brown strata, separated here and there by beds of tufa of a reddish hue. Now, whatever may have been the intelligence of our horses, I had not the slightest reliance upon them as a means of crossing a stormy arm of the sea. To ride over salt water upon the back of a little horse seemed to me absurd. If they are really intelligent, I said to myself, they will certainly not make the attempt. In any case, I shall trust rather to my own intelligence than theirs. But my uncle was in no humor to wait. He dug his heels into the sides of his steed, and made for the shore. His horse went to the very edge of the water, sniffed at the approaching wave, and retreated. My uncle, who was, sooth to say, quite as obstinate as the beast he bestrode, insisted on making the desired advance. This attempt was followed by a new refusal on the part of the horse, which quietly shook its head. This demonstration of rebellion was followed by a volley of words and stout applications of whipcord, also followed by kicks on the part of the horse, which threw its head and heels upward and tried to throw his rider. At length, the sturdy little pony, spreading out his legs in a stiff and ludicrous attitude, got from under the professor's legs and left him standing, with both feet on a separate stone, like the Colossus of Rhodes. "'Wretched animal!' cried my uncle, suddenly transformed into a foot-passenger, and as angry and ashamed as a dismounted cavalry officer on the field of battle. Faria said the guide, tapping him familiarly on the shoulder. "'What, a ferry-boat?' Durr, answered Hans, pointing to where lay the boat in question. There. Well, I cried, delighted with the information. So it is. Why did you not say so before, cried my uncle. Why not start at once? 
Tidvatten, said the guide. What does he say? I asked, considerably puzzled by the delay and the dialogue. He says tide, replied my uncle, translating the Danish word for my information. Of course, I understand. We must wait till the tide serves. For Beda? asked my uncle. Ya, yeah, replied Hans. My uncle frowned, stamped his feet, and then followed the horses to where the boat lay. I thoroughly understood and appreciated the necessity for waiting before crossing the fjord for that moment when the sea, at its highest point, is in a state of slack water. As then neither ebb nor flow can then be felt, the ferry boat was in no danger of being carried out to sea or dashed upon the rocky coast. The favorable moment did not come until six o'clock in the evening. Then my uncle, myself, and guide, two boatmen and the four horses got into a very awkward flat-bottomed boat. Accustomed, as I had been to the steam ferry boats of the Elbe, I found the long oars of the boatmen but sorry means of locomotion. We were more than an hour in crossing the fjord, but at length the passage was concluded without accident. Half an hour later we reached Gardar. End of chapter 9「Chapter Ten of Journey to the Center of the Earth by Jules Verne. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. This recording by Brian Aidy. Journey to the Center of the Earth by Jules Verne. Chapter Ten. Traveling in Iceland. It ought, one would have thought, to have been night even in the sixty-fifth parallel of latitude. But still the nocturnal illumination did not surprise me, for in Iceland, during the months of June and July, the sun never sets. The temperature, however, was very much lower than I expected. I was cold, but even that did not affect me so much as ravenous hunger. Welcome indeed, therefore, was the hut which hospitably opened its doors to us. It was merely the house of a peasant, but in the matter of hospitality, it was worthy of being the palace of a king. As we alighted at the door, the master of the house came forward, held out his hand, and without any further ceremony signaled us to follow him. We followed him, for to accompany him was impossible. A long, narrow, gloomy passage led to the interior of this habitation, made from beams roughly squared by the axe. This passage gave ingress to every room. The chambers were four in number. The kitchen, the workshop where the weaving was carried on, the general sleeping chamber of the family, and the best room, to which strangers were especially invited. My uncle, whose lofty stature had not been taken into consideration when the house was built, contrived to knock his head against the beams of the roof. We were introduced into our chamber, a kind of large room with a hard earthen floor, and lighted by a window, the panes of which were made of a sort of parchment from the intestines of sheep, very far from transparent. The bedding was composed of dry hay, thrown into two long red wooden boxes, ornamented with sentences painted in Icelandic. I really had no idea that we should be made so comfortable. There was one objection to the house, and that was the very powerful odor of dried fish, of macerated meat, and of sour milk, which three fragrances combined did not at all suit my olfactory nerves. As soon as we had freed ourselves from our heavy traveling costume, the voice of our host was heard calling to us to come into the kitchen, the only room in which the Icelanders ever make any fire, no matter how cold it may be. My uncle, nothing loath, hastened to obey this hospitable and friendly invitation. I followed. The kitchen chimney was made on an antique model. A large stone standing in the middle of the room was the fireplace. Above, in the roof, was a hole for the smoke to pass through. This apartment was kitchen, parlor, and dining room all in one. On our entrance, our worthy host, as if he had not seen us before, advanced ceremoniously, uttered a word which means, Be happy, and then kissed both of us on the cheek. His wife followed, pronounced the same word, with the same ceremonial, then the husband and wife, placing their right hands upon their hearts, bowed profoundly. This excellent Icelandic woman was the mother of nineteen children, who, little and big, rolled, crawled, and walked about in the midst of volumes of smoke arising from the angular fireplace in the middle of the room. Every now and then I could see a fresh white head and a slightly melancholy expression of countenance peering at me through the vapor. Both my uncle and myself, however, were very friendly with the whole party, and before we were aware of it there were three or four of the little ones on our shoulders, as many on our boxes, and the rest hanging about our legs. 
Those who could speak kept crying out Salver too, in every possible and impossible key. Those who did not speak only made all the more noise. This concert was interrupted by the announcement of supper. At this moment, our worthy guide, the eider duck hunter, came in after seeing to the feeding and stabling of the horses, which consisted in letting them loose to browse on the stunted green of the Icelandic prairies. There was little for them to eat but moss and some very dry and innutrious grass. Next day they were ready before the door some time before we were. Welcome, said Hans. Then tranquilly, with the air of an automaton, without any more expression in one kiss than another, he embraced the host and hostess and their nineteen children. This ceremony concluded to the satisfaction of all parties, we all sat down to table, that is, twenty-four of us, somewhat crowded. Those who were best off had only two juveniles on their knees. As soon, however, as the inevitable soup was placed on the table, the natural taciturnity common even to Icelandic babies prevailed over all else. Our host filled our plates with a portion of lichen soup of Iceland moss, and by no means of disagreeable flavor, an enormous lump of fish floating in sour butter. After that there came some skir, a kind of curds and whey, served with biscuits and juniper berry juice. To drink we had blonda, skimmed milk with water. I was hungry, so hungry that by way of dessert I finished up with a basin of thick oaten porridge. As soon as the meal was over, the children disappeared whilst the grown-up people sat around the fireplace, on which was placed turf, heather, cow dung, and dried fish bones. As soon as everybody was sufficiently warm, a general dispersion took place, all retiring to their respective couches. Our hostess offered to pull off our stockings and trousers, according to the custom of the country, but as we graciously declined to be so honored, she left us to our bed of dry fodder. Next day at five in the morning we took our leave of these hospitable peasants. My uncle had great difficulty in making them accept a sufficient and proper remuneration. Hans then gave the signal to start. We had scarcely got a hundred yards from Gardar when the character of the country changed. The soil began to be marshy and boggy, and less favorable to progress. To the right, the range of mountains was prolonged indefinitely, like a great system of natural fortifications, of which we skirted the glasses. We met with numerous streams and rivulets which it was necessary to ford, and that without wetting our baggage. As we advanced, the deserted appearance increased, and yet, now and then we could see human shadows flitting in the distance. When a turn of the track brought us within easy reach of one of these spectres, I felt a sudden impulse of disgust at the sight of a swollen head with shining skin, utterly without hair, and whose repulsive and revolting wounds could be seen through his rags. The unhappy wretches never came forward to beg, on the contrary they ran away. Not so quick, however, but that Hans was able to salute them with a universal salver too. "'Spedelsk,' he said. "'A leper,' explained my uncle. The very sound of such a word caused a feeling of repulsion. The horrible affliction known as leprosy, which has almost vanished before the effects of modern science, is common in Iceland. It is not contagious but hereditary, so that marriage is strictly prohibited to these unfortunate creatures. These poor lepers did not tend to enliven our journey, the scene of which was inexpressibly sad and lonely. The very last tufts of grassy vegetation appeared to die at our feet. Not a tree was to be seen except a few stunted willows about as big as blackberry bushes. Now and then we watched a falcon soaring in the gray and misty air, taking his flight toward warmer and sunnier regions. I could not help feeling a sense of melancholy come over me. I sighed for my own native land, and wished to be back with Gretchen. We were compelled to cross several little fjords, and at last came to a real gulf. The tide was at its height, and we were able to get over at once and reach the hamlet of Alftenes about a mile farther. That evening, after fording the Alpha and the Heta, two rivers rich in trout and pike, we were compelled to pass the night in a deserted house, worthy of being haunted by all the phase of Scandinavian mythology. The King of Cold had taken up his residence there, and made us feel his presence all night. The following day was remarkable by its lack of any particular incidents. Always the same damp and swampy soil, the same dreary uniformity, the same sad and monotonous aspect of scenery. In the evening, having accomplished the half of our projected journey, we slept at the annexia of the Krossulp. For a whole mile we had under our feet nothing but lava. This disposition of the soil is called Hron. The crumbled lava on the surface was in some instances like ship cables stretched out horizontally, in others coiled up in heaps. An immense field of lava came from the neighboring mountains, all extinct volcanoes, 
but whose remains showed what they had once been. Here and there could be made out the steam from hot water springs. There was no time, however, for us to take more than a cursory view of these phenomena. We had to go forward with what speed we might. Soon the soft and swampy soil again appeared under the feet of our horses, while at every hundred yards we came upon one or more small lakes. Our journey was now in a westerly direction, and we had, in fact, swept round the great bay of Foxa, and the twin white summits of Sneffels rose to the clouds at a distance of less than five miles. The horses now advanced rapidly. The accidents and difficulties of the soil no longer checked them. I confess that fatigue began to tell severely upon me, but my uncle was as firm and as hard as he had been on the first day. I could not help admiring both the excellent professor and the worthy guide, for they both appeared to regard this rugged expedition as a mere walk. On Saturday, the 20th June, at six o'clock in the evening, we reached Budir, a small town picturesquely situated on the shore of the ocean, and here the guide asked for his money. My uncle settled with him immediately. It was now the family of Hans himself, that is to say, his uncles, his cousins, German, who offered us hospitality. We were exceedingly well received, and without taking too much advantage of the goodness of these worthy people, I should have liked very much to have rested with them after the fatigues of the journey. But my uncle, who did not require rest, had no idea of anything of the kind, and despite the fact that the next day was Sunday, I was compelled once more to mount my steed. The soil was again affected by the neighborhood of the mountains, whose granite peered out of the ground like tops of an old oak. We were skirting the enormous base of the mighty volcano. My uncle never took his eyes from off it. He could not keep from gesticulating and looking at it with a kind of sullen defiance, as much to say, That is the giant I have made up my mind to conquer. After four hours' steady traveling, the horses stopped of themselves before the door of the presbytery of Stapi. End of chapter 10